For months now, Ukraine and its Western allies have been discussing the possibility of another major push into Russian territory. If successful, it could finally allow Ukraine to beat back Putin's troops and retake much of the territory under Russian occupation, some of it held for nearly a decade by this point. And if the last Ukrainian push is anything to judge by, we may see the fighting intensify significantly in the next few weeks. Putin, are you ready for this? Because Ukraine definitely is. We're talking shaping operations, deception tactics, NATO-style assaults, utilizing hundreds of armored fighting vehicles, such as the US Bradley fighting vehicles or French AMX-10s, and more. Let's dive in. The stakes for this coming stage of the war are huge. To maintain Western support, Ukraine needs to show it can utilize the advanced tanks, missile systems, artillery, and other material it's received through the last year. Russia, on the other hand, can hardly afford another humiliating defeat. Losing territory Putin has held since 2014 would be a serious blow and could finally sound the death rattle for the Russian invasion of Ukraine. With stakes this high, there is no doubt that any Ukrainian counteroffensive will be brutal. So let's take a look at how events might play out, what both sides' operations could look like, and what we should expect from this new stage of the war. The first major question is when and where Ukraine might launch its counteroffensive. Many have speculated that its early stages are already underway. A recent series of incidents in Russia or Russian-occupied territory definitely suggests such a strategy. These have included everything from fuel depot explosions in Crimea to partisan attacks in Melitopol, train derailments in Russia's Bryansk region, and a series of spectacular drone explosions in view of the Kremlin itself. Such attacks range from symbolic strikes to more significant attacks and are part of so-called shaping operations, a standard but crucial part of modern military practice. Their primary aim is to deceive and keep the enemy off balance meddle with its mindset, and shape the battlefield in advantageous ways just before a major offensive. While tactics like these have been around for a long time, they may be especially useful in modern conflicts like the Russo-Ukrainian War. John Spencer, chair of Urban Warfare Studies at the Modern War Institute at West Point, recently stated that deception operations have always been a part of war, but now their effect is magnified by social media. They are Ukrainian gray zone operations that require Russia to expend resources, be that troops or information operations. They're like a magician's sleight of hand. They deceive the viewer and force his attention elsewhere. This may prove especially useful in messing with the already strained Russian military. The first suspected shaping operation began when two drones exploded over the Kremlin in Moscow. While Kyiv has denied any involvement, US intelligence officials determined it was most likely carried out by Ukraine. Then, several weeks later, it happened again with multiple drones exploding near the Kremlin, highlighting the capital's vulnerability to potential Ukrainian strikes. Another strange event took place on May 22, when a Ukrainian-backed group of far-right partisans swarmed across the Russian border into the province of Belgorod, creating a flood of mocking memes online which proclaimed the establishment of the Belgorod People's Republic. In Russia, however, the move sparked outrage by hardliners, including leading military bloggers. One such figure, who goes by the handle Rybar on Telegram, recently posted that if the goal of the assault was to stress out the population, then the fact of Ukrainian drones appearing in the skies over Moscow has done enough of that already. Yevgeny Prigozhin, founder of the Wagner paramilitary group, even went so far as to fiercely criticize the defense ministry over its failure to stop the attacks. Mike Martin, a former British Army officer and author who follows the war closely, has also confirmed that the idea is to create a lot of dilemmas for the Russian command structure. Problems, such as a breakthrough of the front line, focus attention. Dilemmas, by contrast, paralyze attention. And so far, this psychological warfare seems to be working pretty well. One anonymous senior Ukrainian official seemed to confirm the presence of shaping operations, saying that a successful offensive starts with a successful psychological offensive and that their Russian morale is not at its highest level. Meanwhile, the psychological effect of the attacks seems to have reached the highest levels of the Russian defense establishment. Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov even admitted that the war is now very difficult and tense work that constantly created questions. Now that Ukraine's shaping operations have created consternation and softened Russian resolve, what comes next? While the BBC reported at the beginning of May that there was still some doubt about whether the counteroffensive would materialize, that seems to have gone away. Independent media outlet Medusa 
discovered that the Kremlin itself has even recognized this, ordering Russian-controlled state media to not lower the expectations of the announced Ukrainian counteroffensive, but try and spin it as a victory instead while blaming the entire West for any more territorial losses. Signs like this definitely suggest that something big is coming, even if nobody outside of Ukrainian command is totally sure what it'll be. However, unlike the lightning Ukrainian offensive last fall, experts believe there is a strong possibility that things will be more incremental this time around. Retired Australian Major General Mick Ryan, who has analyzed the war closely, recently wrote that, I would emphasize there will not be just one big push, but probably several different offensives. This is because both the South and the East present opportunities for offensive action, but it is also because the Ukrainians will want to deceive Russia about their main effort. Such deception tactics already worked extremely well during the fall counteroffensive. For weeks, Ukraine talked up the possibility of a southern route of attack, causing Russian forces to move south and concentrate around Kherson in anticipation of such a push. In response, Ukraine then launched a furious blitzkrieg attack in the north, punching through the thinned-out Russian lines around Kharkiv and retaking more territory in a week than Russia had gained in a month. But while this element of uncertainty worked to the advantage of Ukraine last time around, it might not do so again. As Artur, a Ukrainian soldier deeply involved in frontline operations, relayed to CNN, we will not have an element of surprise, because every smartphone is shouting about this counteroffensive. The Russians may not know where it'll be, or maybe they do, and if they do, they will be prepared. So, how will Kyiv pick the right moment to strike? The biggest factor may actually be weather and terrain conditions. Springtime in Ukraine is notoriously muddy, as snowmelt from the long winter soaks into the topsoil. This mud season has substantially slowed down armored trucks, tanks, and other treaded vehicles, and of course, ground troops. If Ukraine launches its push too soon, its forces could become bogged down in these conditions, rather than being able to use them to its advantage. Another major factor will be whether Ukrainian troops are ready and sufficiently resupplied. President Volodymyr Zelensky recently told Japanese newspaper Yomiuri Shimbun that his government is waiting for ammunition to arrive from our partners. We can't start yet. We can't send our brave soldiers to the front lines without tanks, artillery, and long-range rockets. This is also similar to comments made by Ukrainian Defense Minister Oleksiy Reznikov that as soon as it is God's will, the weather and the commander's decision, we will do it. And it seems likely that as soon as the mud clears and ammo arrives, Ukraine will seize the moment. So, once conditions are right, how might Ukraine attack? There are a number of possible scenarios for mounting the counteroffensive, all of them involving the training and material Ukrainians have received since the start of the war. Phillips O'Brien, professor of strategic studies at the University of St. Andrews, told the Wall Street Journal that Ukraine would ideally like to make a push southeast through Zaporizhia and toward Melitopol and the Sea of Azov. If successful, this would sever Russia's land bridge to Crimea and cut off its supply lines to positions further west. Since this is the most obvious route for Ukraine to take, Russia has beefed up its defensive positions near Zaporizhia in anticipation, digging in with trenches and trying to limit the paths of advance. However, O'Brien believes that these measures will not be enough, as one thing the Ukrainians have been good at is seeing where they can take advantage of weaker points in the Russian line. The key thing is to have some success. Wherever Russian troops are dug in, Ukraine will likely make an effort to trap them or move forces around the fixed fortifications. Whatever route they take, Ukrainian forces will need a combination of skill and luck to press their advantage. They've been training for months in Western Europe and in the US to operate modern combat equipment and execute large, complex battlefield formations. The most critical element of the offensive is likely to be Ukrainian skill in combined arms maneuvers. Its ability to coordinate different assets, including air power, tank units, artillery, and foot soldiers. And despite the increased training and powerful Western weapons, there is little chance that Ukraine can launch a large-scale NATO-style assault, since doing so requires air superiority that neither side has achieved. The textbook strategy for dealing with an entrenched enemy would be a sudden, massive air assault with fighter jets, bombers, and cruise missiles, similar to early U.S. operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. And according to U.S. Army War College professor Colonel John Nagel, the fact that Ukraine only has a limited number of fighter planes and choppers means it's unlikely to risk them all in a frontal assault. Instead, Ukraine is likely to launch multiple coordinated smaller attacks using ground-based precision weaponry. 
Many of these artillery and rocket systems have been donated by NATO countries and include some powerful equipment, like the US M142 HIMARS, M270 mobile rocket launchers, and French Caesar howitzers. Many of these systems can fire satellite-guided explosive rounds more than 50 miles, with far more accuracy than Russian artillery. The long range of these Western weapons, plus top-notch intelligence out of Kyiv and the West, will allow Ukraine to target Russian forces far behind the front lines, pinning them down. Ukrainian troops have already demonstrated the ability to do this throughout the past year, landing strikes on Russian supply lines, ammunition depots, command centers, and logistics bases. These strikes have enabled them to isolate Russia's battlefield units from their commanders and reinforcements, confuse them, and degrade their ability to retaliate. Following long-range strikes by artillery and rockets, Ukrainian troops will then most likely attempt a large advance, possibly along multiple points on the front where Russian lines are the weakest. This is similar to the approach that the US or other NATO countries would take for such an offensive, minus the air dominance. Another major difference is that most Western forces would be led by a vanguard of advanced modern battle tanks, able to clear enemy lines with punishing fire. Ukraine, of course, only has a small number of these modern tanks and relatively little armor overall. Estimates suggest that it still has more than 100 Soviet-era tanks from its own stockpiles, while the UK is set to deliver 14 of its Challenger II tanks, and at least 22 German-manufactured Leopard II tanks will soon arrive from Poland and Norway, with more on the way. While the US has also pledged some of its M1 Abrams models, they're not supposed to arrive until later this year, making them little use in the coming offensive. And although the Soviet tanks lack the armor, firepower, and accuracy of Western armor, many of them have been upgraded with new equipment, such as night vision optics, computer targeting, and secure communication systems. Behind the initial surge of battle tanks, Ukraine will probably utilize dozens or hundreds of armored fighting vehicles for close support. While they lack the firepower of a true tank, many of these, such as the US Bradley fighting vehicles or French AMX-10s, have treads and gun turrets that can pack a serious punch. The Bradley, for instance, weighs in at just over 30 tons and is designed to provide infantry and artillery units with armor and mobile cover fire against enemy troops and vehicles. To do this, its main weapon is a massive 25mm M242 Bushmaster chain gun, capable of firing up to 300 rounds a minute. This means that a Bradley can make quick work of an unprepared Russian T-72 tank from more than a mile away. It also carries two tow anti-tank missiles, able to destroy targets at a range of over two miles. These weapons mean that while they're no substitute for tanks, armored fighting vehicles will certainly help Ukraine make up for its comparative lack of armor. And behind and alongside the heavily weaponized vehicles, Ukraine will also probably follow up with a range of armored infantry carriers, like the US Strikers. The Striker is a fast and highly mobile eight-wheeled armored vehicle produced by General Dynamics and mostly used by the United States. Primarily intended for transporting foot soldiers and holding territory, it's also capable of holding off Russian infantry moving in on Ukrainian positions. Experts largely agree that although they are no substitute for more powerful guns, infantry carriers will still be very valuable in the coming months. Colonel Nagel told the journal that while I'd prefer to be in an M1, the truth is that infantry fighting vehicles are going to be able to do a lot of damage. John Spencer, a chair of urban warfare studies with the New York-based Madison Policy Forum, also stressed that to maintain Western support, Ukraine needs to make some tangible progress on the battlefield soon before more shipments of advanced weaponry arrive, demonstrating that Ukraine still has the resolve and ability to push Russian lines further back will show the West that military aid has made a difference and increase the political feasibility of sending more. A Ukrainian spring offensive with Leopards and Bradleys in the lead will do more for them in the alliances than any actual ground they take back," Spencer added. Ukraine has to have movement and has to have wins. If it does not, there's a strong possibility that international support will dwindle, something Ukrainians definitely want to avoid. But will all this Western equipment really make that much of a difference? The short answer is yes, we just don't know how much. It's pretty clear that Ukraine will need all the firepower available to try and dislodge Russian positions. While Russia has spent much of the war falling into ambushes again and again, this time it appears as though their troops might attempt something new. General Ryan wrote in a recent analysis that this time the Ukrainians will have to fight through more dense obstacle belts established by the Russians in the east and the south, 
Much like the tactics Ukraine has used in places like Kyiv and Volodar, these will be designed to channel attackers into killing zones, as well as slow down and break up the cohesion of attacks. With nearly a year to build up their defensive positions, Russian forces are incredibly dug in and clearly willing to go to extraordinary lengths to hold the territory they currently occupy. In fact, the UK Ministry of Defense recently wrote that Russia has constructed some of the most extensive systems of military defensive works seen anywhere in the world for many decades, not just near the current front lines, but also deep inside areas Russia currently controls. Intelligence reports and satellite imagery show a particular effort to fortify the northern border of Crimea with a multi-layered defensive zone built up around the village of Medvedevka, including minefields designed to force Ukraine into a choke point. Russia has also reportedly dug hundreds of miles of trenches far inside its internationally recognized territory, particularly in the Belgorod and Kursk regions. Fortifications this far back suggest the Russian commanders consider Ukraine retaking its territory and pushing into Russia proper to be a real possibility. The UK Defense Ministry noted that defenses highlight Russian leaders' deep concern that Ukraine could achieve a major breakthrough, but that at the same time some works have likely been ordered by local commanders and civil leaders in attempts to promote the official narrative that Russia is threatened by Ukraine and NATO. And when it comes to the months ahead, there are still major uncertainties about which way the battles will go. As many have pointed out, Ukrainian forces are far more motivated and in many cases better armed than their Russian counterparts. But Russia has its now extensive defensive positions and has shown an astonishing willingness to expend manpower and material. Despite historic Russian losses so far, the country's military has yet to enter a total state of collapse. And as mentioned earlier, whatever happens, it's likely to be pretty soon. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg recently confirmed that more than 98% of the combat vehicles promised to Ukraine have been delivered already, and that means over 1,550 armored vehicles, 230 tanks and other equipment, including vast amounts of ammunition. In total, we have trained and equipped more than nine new Ukrainian armored brigades. This will put Ukraine in a strong position to continue to retake occupied territory. There is little question that these supplies will pose a massive challenge to Russia's ability to hold on to its occupied territory. But it's also a matter of more than just firepower. To deal with the type and scale of defenses that Russia has set up, including trenches, tank ditches, dragon's teeth, mines, and other hazards, Ukraine will also need to undertake some dangerous and slow work carried out by specialized teams. To avoid stumbling blindly into ambushes the way Russian commanders have been, scouts and minesweepers must be deployed before any major infantry or tank assault can take place. But even here, Western support could make all the difference, as General Ryan has pointed out that the last few American aid packages have recognized this with large amounts of combat engineering equipment. This may also not be a problem everywhere along the front, as Russia's physical defenses are only an issue if they remain well defended. If Russian troops leave their trenches and other positions, Ukraine can just move in and bulldoze them before advancing. Considering that Russia has lost upwards of 200,000 soldiers so far, there's a possibility that they simply no longer have the manpower to occupy all the defensive zones. So rather than make the mistake of digging in and fighting catastrophic pitched battles, Ukrainian commanders may choose to just cut through any areas where defending lines are weak. If they're able to pull this off and break into areas behind the front line, Ukrainians could capture both Russian troops and large areas of territory in very little time. Yet few experts believe that it'll be a complete rout. In giving Ukraine more and more advanced weaponry, the goal of the West has been to crush Russian troops just enough. The hope is that this will pressure Putin into some sort of peace talks where he could be forced to give up at least the territory which he has held since February 2022. But according to the Wall Street Journal and other sources, few officials have any confidence the war and peace will unfold so neatly. While most believe that even newly supplied with armaments, Ukrainian forces are unlikely to gain such a decisive enough battlefield advantage that Kyiv is in the position to demand the return of all that ground. Official intelligence reports seem to confirm this estimate. A leaked report from the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency assessed that even if Ukraine recaptures significant territory and inflicts unsustainable losses on Russian troops, Putin will not give in. Instead, it concluded that negotiations to end the conflict are unlikely during 2023 in all considered scenarios. 
But all things considered, there are a number of reasons why this counteroffensive could be one of the most important stages of the conflict so far. At the most, as General Ryan pointed out to ABC News, Ukraine wants to re-seize the initiative in this war by taking back territory and further degrading Russian capabilities. But there's also a psychological component to the coming offensive, which Ryan describes as a battle of wills, where destroying Russian morale will be an important objective. If Putin is ever to come to the negotiating table, it will require a true loss of support from both foot soldiers and commanders. Since he's so far shown a complete disregard for the lives of his people and a willingness to fight a brutal war of attrition, Ukraine needs to demonstrate to the Russians, from Putin to the bottom of their army, that they cannot win this war and that their days in Ukraine are numbered. Ukraine's upgraded equipment also gives its troops a psychological advantage over Russian forces, who are barely being trained and relying on stockpiles of near-obsolete Soviet equipment. As Ryan explains it, imagine you're the tank crew of an old Russian tank that is three to four times as old as you are, and imagine then that you've been briefed that you'll be coming up against the latest Western tanks. Regardless of what the ludicrous Russian propaganda tells us, this will have a significant impact on Russian morale and quickly racking up wins against Russian defenders could have a similar effect, providing a foundation to at least slow down the violence. But will this pan out? And just how successful do you think this counteroffensive could be? Let us know in the comments below. And don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis.